Did you know that the Pennsylvania Railroad owned a narrow-gauge short line in western Pennsylvania? You may not have. But today on The Round Us, we're going to talk about the Washington and Waynesburg Railroad. All aboard! In days past, the roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozerak, and this is episode number 86 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby. You name it, we discuss it. Today, we are talking to Jim Weinshaker. He is the railroad liaison for the Greene County Historical Society and an expert on the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad, a 28-mile short line in three-foot gauge. And we're going to learn about the pieces of equipment that survive, a steam locomotive and a passenger car, very rare pieces. Jim and his crew with the W&W at the Greene County Historical Society are restoring them, and we're going to learn more about this. This is an interesting hidden gem because even living in western Pennsylvania as I do, I'd never heard about this railroad until I was introduced to it by a couple of friends of mine. Shout out to Zach and Matt. This is going to be a cool adventure for all of us. Before we get to that, though, a couple of things I want to update you on. First is that you remember Wandering Spirit? You may or may not. So last year, I introduced the concept to take an HO scale model railroad passenger car and see if it could travel across all 50 states. Well, last year, Dan, a listener of the Roundhouse podcast, was visiting from Australia. He came to Meadville. And so as a bonus round, I thought, well, let's see if the car could travel internationally. So it went back with him to Australia. And then it went over to England. In fact, it had its photo taken with Flying Scotsman. Yes, the Flying Scotsman. There's photos of it on the blog post. Well, I'm happy to report that it's back in the U.S. If you want to see where it's been so far and to learn how you can be part of this rail car's journey and help us to get this car to travel through all 50 states, visit the blog post. There's a link in the description for the show notes for this episode, number 85. You can read about the progress and you can read about how you can get involved. I'd also like to give a shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, Age of Steam Roundhouse. Be sure, if you haven't already this season, to put them on your fall visit list. They are still conducting tours. Check them out at ageofsteamroundhouse.org. Our guest today is an expert on the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad and is the railroad liaison for the Greene County Historical Society. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mr. Jim Weinshanker. Hey, Nick. Good evening. Thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate it. Glad to have you on the show, Jim, because this is an interesting little narrow gauge line that even living in Western Pennsylvania, as I do, I had no idea about. And Thanks to mutual friends, I'm coming to learn more about. So perhaps you could share with our audience a general nutshell overview history of what was the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad. Sure, no problem. Um, The Waynesburg and Washington Railroad was a 28-mile narrow gauge, as you indicated, ran between the Greene County uh, seat of Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, ran directly north to the Washington County seat of Washington, PA. Um, The railroad was chartered on May 18th of 1875. Uh, Later on that summer, they started laying rail in uh, Washington and headed south to Waynesburg. The rail ended up uh, right outside of Waynesburg in West Waynesburg, and the Golden Spike was driven on November 1st of 1877. It wouldn't be until the latter uh, latter years in the eighteen late eighteen eighties that they did come in, come into Waynesburg proper, uh, buying six lots in South Waynesburg for the Waynesburg yard. So uh, the initial history was it stopped outside of Waynesburg and West Waynesburg, and then came into Waynesburg proper. 
They ran as an independent railroad uh, for about 10 years. Uh, they were involved with the Baltimore and Ohio and uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad in Washington. Uh, both companies wanted the W&W in the worst way, and it ended up that the PRR won the battle, a, a stock proxy battle, and uh, they purchased the W&W in 1885. Um, still ran as the W and W, you know, letter on the, the box cars, the passenger cars, the uh, the locomotives until 1920, when the Pennsylvania Railroad reorganized and they relettered everything Pennsylvania. Um, passenger service lasted until July 9th, 1929, and freight steam service lasted until April 6th of 1933. General overview of the equipment is their first construction locomotive was a 14 ton 240 Porter. They had three flat cars and a box car as their work train. Uh, those cars were purchased from Bill Meyer and Small. As the railroad grew over the years, so did the locomotives and the, the fleet. Uh, they went to a couple 440s from Porter and ended up on the 260 Mogul configuration, which uh, best worked for the railroad. Uh, they had um, 20,000 box car or 20,000 pound box cars, 40,000 pound cars, and ended up with 60,000 pound cars that were built by the Fort Wayne shops. Um, as I noted, uh, steam service ended in April 6, 1933. After that, they ran a 1940 Ford, 1940 Ford um, box truck. It was a uh, narrow gauge configuration. Uh, once that was done. They ran Fairmont speeders, and then in uh, 1978, all rails were um, removed by a scrapping company. And uh, what we have left now are a couple bridges, a couple um, uh, stations, a um, little bit of rail here and there, but um, the right of way is very visible in the wintertime. It's very easy to follow. So um, that kind of gives you a, a good overview of, um, of the W. &W. Uh, from its beginning uh, to its uh, post-abandonment um, in the latter years. In this case, narrow gauge meant that the railroad was built to three feet between the rails as opposed to the standard gauge four feet, eight and a half inches. Why do you suppose from your research they chose that size? Was it a cost-saving measure? They didn't think it'd have too much uh, heavy cargo. What was the rationale there? Um, a couple of reasons there, Nick. First and foremost, uh, the terrain in southwestern Pennsylvania is very hilly. Um, within the 28 miles, there were two major grades that the W&W &W had to pull. Coming straight out of Washington, they were on a 2.8% grade, took them up to Summit Siding, um, went down in the valley again, hit the next hill uh, up to West Union, and came down to water level um, 10 Mile Creek into Waynesburg. So um, that was the, the first and foremost reason uh, why they went to narrow gauge, smaller equipment, lighter equipment, because of the big grades. Uh, again, with the railroad being built around the 1870s, uh, you know, mid 1870s, narrow gauge was pretty hot at that time in, in the tri, tri state area, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West, West Virginia. Uh, so they decided to go with the narrow gauge equipment, um, again, as a cost saving. So combining the cost savings, the uh, the hilly terrain of southwestern PA, that's why they decided on the, the narrow gauge instead of a standard gauge uh, railroad. When people think of narrow gauge in Pennsylvania, probably what they think of first and foremost is the East Broadtop, which is in the central part of the state which is the same size but a completely separate network. What are some of the pieces of this railroad's history that you believe give it its unique flavor and kind of make it stand out in the landscape of railroading history? First of all, uh, I would say, Nick, that um, this railroad opened up the economic prosperity of Greene County. Up until the W&W &W being built, uh, the way that the, the farmers and the merchants transported their goods was over the river, the Monongahela River, or on, you know, crudely uh, constructed roads. Um, it was expensive. It was laborious. It took a long time to get their um, their goods to market. So when the, uh, uh, the merchants of uh, Greene County got together and said, hey, we need a railroad, and they came up with the W&W, 
um, that uh, the economic explosion was just unbelievable uh, within the Greene County area. You could now get to Washington and back in a day. You could go to Pittsburgh and back in a day. You could get your goods to a central depot, get them out to Washington and, and beyond just your, your pounds in Greene County. So um, the, the history there, uh, just uh, the fact that it was the first railroad in Greene County just you know speaks volumes of, of, uh, of the railroad itself. Um, some other unique history or notable stories on the road was uh, the day, the last day of passenger service on July 9th, 1929. One of the conductors, uh, James Shaw, uh, when the, the last passenger train pulled out of the Waynesburg Depot and went around the curb, um, he fell to the ground and suffered a fatal heart attack. And they said that he always uh, uh, died from a broken heart because his his favorite railroad was was to be no more. So that that's always an interesting story that um, that's been passed around. Um, some other notable stories: um, there were some presidents that came in on the W and W. Uh, President Taft came in. Um, they also hosted some uh, famous actors. Uh, that came in uh, to the Opera House, which was the uh, um, the vaudeville show place in Waynesburg. So um, just a couple pieces of history there that the W&W has ex- experienced. So I've been reading the book called Three Feet on the Panhandle, A History of the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad by Larry Kohler and Morgan Gavert. A really great book, hard to get your hands on, but if you start listening to this episode and think, oh, this is interesting Railroad. I recommend you get it through an interlibrary loan. It's been out of print for a while, but I've been reading it. And what I love is that the f- it's this real oddity. When you think of the Pennsylvania Railroad, you're thinking of K4s on the Broadway Limited. You're thinking of Gigi Wedge. You're not thinking of this little 28-mile short line, narrow gauge short line, winding its way through hilly southwestern Pennsylvania. And and that as you said, they didn't repaint the equipment till the twenties. So it still right. So it still had this kind of this uh, homegrown feel, even though it was owned by a very large corporation. Absolutely, the flavor of it too, because you mentioned uh, the conductor story there. There's a a lot of cases where the authors are highlighting where. People really made their careers and their families took on these careers uh, for the 50 plus years of the railroad's heyday. It really seemed to be a a local legacy. Yeah. um, Fathers and sons worked on the railroad together. Uh, Grandfathers, uncles, um, even husband and wife. Um, The the story there is um, in Sycamore. um, There was a husband and wife that owned the general store. And uh, right next to the store was the freight depot for the WW, but the, uh, the tickets were, were sold out of the, the Weaver store. Uh, it was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Weaver. They had a general store in Sycamore. So you went over to their store and you bought your, your passenger car tickets. But if you had freight come in on the railroad or the freight was going out on the railroad, you went next door to the, the little freight depot um, to transact your transact your business, uh, that that's pretty interesting. So um, yes, definitely, it was a family affair uh, on the railroad up and down uh, the entire twenty eight miles. And for the Pennsylvania, how do you think their corporate view was to this type of operation because it was so unusual for them? I mean, wasn't their only narrow gauge railroad, but it wasn't like they had tons of them. So do you think they kept they got what they were looking for out of it when they made that purchase in 1885? Or do you think they would had greater hopes for it that just never got realized? It's a little both, Nick. Uh, the, the PRR had the foresight to see that Greene County had very vast and rich coal fields, um, huge, huge quantities, vast quantities of coal uh, that's in Greene County. And they knew eventually that that coal had to come out of Greene County other than on the river. So, uh, you know, they purchased the railroad with looking into the future that they would, uh, the W&W would be a coal hauler. Um, you know, they would widen the gauge to four, eight and a half to, to the standard, standard gauge. 
and uh, huge coal trains would come out over the W&W. But as we talked about earlier in the show, you know, that the, the hilly terrain, um, that didn't pan out. But um, eventually through the, the successions, you know, the, the Pennsylvania, Lake, Pennsylvania Lake Erie, the Monongahela Railroad, um, they were the ones that, that hauled the coal out of Greene County. Um, there is a little trackage, little W&W trackage that the, uh, the coal haulers, Norfolk Southern and CSX come out of Waynesburg today. They go on it for a couple hundred yards, but that's it. But um, the PRR officials back in the day, they, they saw that. They wanted to, to buy this railroad so they would be the exclusive coal hauler um, out of Greene County. So um, it, it did kind of work, but with other railroads when it, it eventually came to fruition. It'd be very easy then to look at its history and say it was one of the many railroads that existed, uh, suffered heavily once roads started to catch up to rails, especially with the agricultural business that the railroad depended on. And that would be that, except for a steam locomotive known as second number four. I'm wondering if you can provide the history of that engine and how it's kind of come to serve as an ambassador of sorts of the railroad. Sure, sure. Um, as we noted that the, uh, the, the locomotive of the day when the, the railroad was in a slow day was the Mogul, the 260. Um, they got their, their first, t- first 260, which was first number four. They really liked the way that the, the machine, um, plied the rails. It was the, the right locomotive for freight and passenger. They could interchange it out on trains. They just kept buying that same uh, same type of locomotive. As they worked through the years, and number uh, first number four wore out, um, it was time to buy another one. So that's where second number four came into existence. Uh, in May of 1916, uh, construction number five five eight four seven uh, was out shopped at the Alco Cook Works in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, number four came to the ra- uh, came to the W&W rails. Um, it was used primarily as a freight engine um, throughout the throughout the years. Um, it did serve uh, briefly as a passenger engine in the latter years. Uh, and the history goes that um, it pulled the last passenger train on July 9, 1929, because um, second number one uh, sprung a leak. Uh, steam leak on one of its cylinders and they took it out of service. Number four was right there in Washington. They brought it out, hooked up the train and um, headed it into Waynesburg and back. Um, And throughout the years, um, this locomotive has been squirreled away, so to speak, with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, Looking at my notes here, the first time that it was Taken off of the W&W rails was in April 1933. They shipped it to Canton, Ohio for storage. Um, in 1936, August 1936, it was cosmetically restored and taken to the Wheeling, West Virginia Centennial Celebration where it was placed under steam. Uh, 1953, it went from the Canton shops to the North Umberland Roundhouse to be stored with the other PRR motive power and everybody if anybody knows their PRR history the Northumberland Roundhouse uh, was going to be the historic locomotive collection of the the Pennsylvania Railroad so again somebody in the PRR uh, PRR official had the foresight to say hey this is a special locomotive it's a narrow gauge it's the only one we have we're going to put that in the collection Um, the uh, officials from the Green County Historical Society in the mid-50s caught wind that number four was still in existence, and they wrote a letter to the PRR and asked for their locomotive back. So the, uh, the PRR obliged. They cosmetically restored it once again at the Juniata shops in July of 1958 and brought it back to Waynesburg in August of 1958 with all the pomp and circumstance. Um, the locomotive stayed on the grounds uh, of the fairgrounds, the Green County Fairgrounds there in Waynesburg until June of 1974 when it was moved to the Historical Society, the museum grounds east of, little east of Waynesburg. Um, to make a long story short, in the mid to late 70s, the locomotive was restored to operating condition. They ran it on 400 feet of track there at the museum during our annual harvest festival 
and other special occasions, the last themed in 85. And it's been on static display ever since. Um, we did cosmetically restore the locomotive in the summer of 2000. And um, as we noted at the, the top of the show, that uh, we are under restoration efforts once again here in 2019 do a cosmetic restoration first and then uh, move into um, operational restoration um, at a later date. The inevitable question being, from what you've assessed, what would the locomotive need for an operational restoration? Two things. Uh, We would have to bring um, experts in, maybe from Strasburg, or out at the you know age of age of steam roundhouse, uh, their mechanical experts come in and do a top to bottom and in, inside and out evaluation. Okay, this locomotive is going to need a boiler repair. It's going to need a new boiler. It's going to need this. It's, that needs going to be repaired, replaced, so on and so forth. Um, once that assertion is um, is documented and we decide to move forward with the restoration you have to go through the ultrasound process and uh, the hydro uh, process um, if the locomotive passes both of those and then it'll be up to the board of directors if they want to pursue full restoration to operation which we all know is a very large sum of money uh, there would be have to be great great effort put forth um, to raise those type of funds to bring the, uh, the, the locomotive um, back to operation. Um, it's not unheard of. There are many other organizations throughout the United States that do this day in and day out. We're no different. Um, it's just if the board of directors want to take on this large project and this uh, large amount of money fundraising to put it back on the rails and uh, return it to operation. Um, we do need do need a few appliances for it. The injectors are gone, the whistle is gone, uh, the steam gauges are missing, but um, those are easy items that we can pick up and, and put them back on you know, the locomotive uh, once it's operational. Um, one thing we are exploring now is a place to run it. Like I said, we do have 400 feet of track on the museum grounds, but um, it's all the original track from 1978 when the Monongahela Railway track game track gang uh, laid the track so nothing's been done uh, we will need to uh, repair the track each so the locomotive does have a place to run um, one thing that it does have going for it has been undercover or inside a building since uh, it came back to Waynesburg in 58 so it's not like it's a park engine that's been weather beaten for almost 50 years um, it has been under some type of cover or some type of building uh, for for quite a while, and we just put up a new steel structure building about seven years ago. Uh, so it is inside and safe. Um, just trying to keep it stabilized and determine what our next steps are for uh, full operation. Every horse needs a stable, especially those made from iron. The Age of Steam Roundhouse is a brand new facility constructed less than a decade ago housing nearly two dozen steam locomotives. The facility features an 18-stall, accurately reconstructed brick roundhouse surrounding a 115-foot turntable, the largest private collection of steam locomotives in the world, and a fully functioning working back shop where skilled staff actively continue to restore and repair steam locomotives. Having visited multiple times, I could say that it's a very different experience from other museums. Now, the Age of Steam Roundhouse is opening its doors to the public. Tours will be offered Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, May through October 2019, of the Roundhouse and Shop area. Tickets can be purchased in advance, and to see their other upcoming events, follow them on social media and visit their website at ageofsteamroundhouse.org. Green County Historical Society is just that. It's a historical society representing all these different aspects of life in Green County in southwestern Pennsylvania. What's nice about how things have been set up is that for visitors, you're getting a slice of all pieces of life of which the railroad is one, but the railroad is 
well balanced in those other elements with the other buildings on the property. Maybe you could kind of provide a, an overview of sort of what the grounds look as a whole and some of the buildings that are there. Um, at a very high level, the Greene County Historical Society, as we call the museum, <clears throat> was the Greene County Poor Farm. Uh, uh, those that could not make it on their own or had no place else to live, um, they went to the Poor Farm um, to live their life. It was a self-sustaining environment. Um, they had a 52-room mansion, uh, kitchen facilities, uh, a boiler house, uh, their own butcher shop. Um, had a barn, a uh, huge uh, two-level barn where they kept their uh, their livestock. Basically, uh, they it was a, a very early commune. Um, they could everything that they needed was right there on the grounds, and uh, they they really didn't need the outside world to uh, you know for uh, to, to live. So as the the years went by. Um, it turned into uh, into a retirement home in in the latter years. Um, then I think it was back in the '60s, late '60s, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. A new retirement home was built across the street, and the Green County Commissioners um, approached the Historical Society because they were looking for a home and said, "Hey, we can lease this property to you indefinitely for a dollar a year." And of course, they jumped on it. So we have a 52-room mansion. Uh, the boiler house is now our library and our research facility. Uh, the barn is where we hold um, activities. Um, and like you said, Nick, there there is everything on the property um, in Greene County. Uh, our military history, our Indian history um, is representative. How the folks did live at the poor farm back in the day is, is representative. The medical community is representative. Waynesburg College, which is now the university, you know, there are artifacts there. So it, it's an ever evolving um, place of Greene County history. We're finding more and more unique artifacts within the archives and we're putting them out on display. So um, you hit the nail on the head when you can get. Uh, Everything that you know, slice of slice of Green County in one one stop, including the railroad, where you can see you know the locomotive and and Coach Six, which is on the property. Coach Six is an interesting case. So the book that I alluded to earlier, when you look at the roster for this the pastor cars, they're all listed as all scrapped. Although number six is listed as not sure. Fortunately. They were incorrect, and number six survived. That is a really neat story, and I, I think our listeners will get a kick out of how that one's traveled so far to come back home. Exactly. Um, coach six was a sister coach to, to number five. They were purchased new uh, from the Jackson and Sharp Company in November of 1892. Uh, came to Waynesburg on a uh, standard gauge flat car from uh, Wilmington, Delaware into Washington and unloaded in Washington. Uh, they both plied the rails uh, up and down the 28 miles back and forth until July 9th, 1929. Uh, Coach 6 was in the very last passenger uh, revenue train uh, along with number 4 and um, when the passenger service ended, um, the WW tried to uh, tried to sell their cars. Uh, some of them were sold, and uh, one was number six. It was purchased by the Adipolgus Clay Company in Adipolgus, Georgia. Um, so they, uh, I don't know if they trucked it or they put it on rails on a flat car to get it down to Georgia. That's that's unclear, but nonetheless, the car went from Washington to Georgia. And it ran into clay pits down there. It was a miner's coach, and then it was a payroll coach. Uh, later on into the, the 30s, into the early 40s, the Adipolgus Clay Company uh, purchased trucks, and they disbanded the railroad. So the car was moved offline and used as a, uh, a union hall. Um, and then it was later purchased by uh, a resident in Adipolgus and used as a house. So when the locomotive, number four, was running uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, the folks down there, the rail bus, were looking for anything that was left from the WW, passenger car-wise or freight car-wise, to run behind number four. 
So they found this passenger coach. They went down to Georgia, uh, made a deal, bought the coach, and put her on a truck from Georgia and brought it back to Waynesburg. Well, it sat on the grounds at the Historical Society for a long, long time until the 90s. Uh, those who were going to restore it uh, ran out of enthusiasm as well as money, and um, they just sat there. And the museum wanted rid of it. So fortunately, Bob Hungerford from the Connecticut Antique Machinery Association in Kent, Connecticut, uh, they have Hawaii Railway Number no. 5 locomotive, and they also have the Tyanesta Valley 111 caboose that they restored. They heard about this narrow-gauge coach. Uh, they wanted one to run up there on their property. They purchased it and trucked it from Waynesburg to Connecticut. Unfortunately, Mr. Hungerford ran into some uh, medical issues, kind of backed out of the association, and the coach just sat there. Nobody did anything with it. And it was taking a valuable space in their brand-new engine house. So a couple years ago, they offered it for sale. I was trolling the Internet one night, found out it's for sale, made some contacts, uh, asked them if they could donate the coach back to us. They said, sure. So we went up in August of 2015, put it on a truck, and brought it back to Waynesburg, where it sits today. So if you're following the bouncing ball, it went from Wilmington, Delaware to Washington, ran Waynesburg to Washington until July 9th, 1929, went to Georgia, came back to Waynesburg from Georgia, went to Connecticut, and came back to Waynesburg in August of 2015. Non-revenue miles, I've estimated that coach has traveled about 3,500 non-revenue miles. And pure and simple, it's just absolutely bottom line luck that this coach has survived and it is back home with, with uh, one of the original locomotives from the W&W. The other piece of luck, too, is the condition it's in. Now, I'll have photos in the show notes for this episode. It looks rough to the untrained eye. You look at it, it's like, oh, it, it, it needs paint. It, the, the ends of the wood are a bit rotted. But in this case, the looks are deceiving because it's actually in much better shape than some of the other restoration candidates you'd see on other railroads. Yes, and that's uh, the fact that when it was a house down in Georgia, they enclosed the entire car with uh, with tin. So it was cocooned, so to speak, uh, away from the element, kept the elements away from the, the wood pieces, um, which was positive. And then when it was up at Connecticut Antique Machinery Association, like I, I stated, it was inside their new engine house, for at least 15 years. It sat out very little. Um, currently in Waynesburg, uh, like I said, we have our new engine house. We do have space for it. Uh, we're looking for a concrete bid to finish the other side of the floor in the engine house to get Coach 6 inside, and it'll be inside permanently. But, yeah, uh, you're right, Nick. It does look a little rough, but by my estimates, um, I did a calculation one night. It's maybe one of 74. Five, maybe a hundred narrow gauge coaches still in existence. Um, you know, it depends on what you read and what rosters you can find. So it is a very, very rare piece um, to, of narrow gauge history, uh, uh, generally and specifically. It's it's one of about sixteen passenger cars that the W and W had. So. For it to be back in Waynesburg, traveled over 3,500 miles, and, you know, it's, it's definitely in restorable condition. It's just pure luck, plain and simple. It's, it's just all luck, and I'd rather be lucky than good any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good call. And in my book, it's a Jackson and Sharp car, and I've always had a soft spot for their car building. I think they make the quintessential 1880s, 1890s coach. And it's always a treasure when you find one of those and have the opportunity to work on those. Yeah, it's definitely a masterpiece. We've been working since April 29th of this year. Uh, We're disassembling one side of the interior, and I do mean disassemble. It's not a demolition project. Um, It's a careful disassemble uh, documentation with notes, drawings, photographs. Uh, we tag the pieces uh, because it's in good enough condition where we're pulling off enough good pieces of woodwork where we can either restore them or use them as masters. Uh, we have a cabinet maker that is offering his shop um, to, uh, to, to make all of the wood pieces for the car. 
So, um, uh, yeah, we are lucky, very, very lucky to have it. It's, it's in great condition for being 127 years old, 129 years old, uh, right around there. Um, very little damage to the inside. The roof is solid. Um, the wood pieces, uh, look pretty good. Um, again, it's, it's just pure luck in, uh, and we are so happy to have it. And it is a great candidate for restoration. It won't look like it came off, you know, just rolled off the, you know, the, the shop floor, but, um, we can do a, a great job, um, bringing it back to life and it, it would be a proud piece to show and display at the, at the museum. One of the elements that I love about historic restorations of this type is that it kind of feels like an archaeological dig because you learn so much about the piece of history as you're restoring it. An example being that this past weekend when I was down helping you to restore this car, our mutual friend Matt was showing me that he would kind of sanded away some of the old paint and uncovered some of the, the Pensy gold striping on the ends of the car. And it's it's wonderful to be able to make discoveries like that, too. Yeah, and that's what's been happening. Um, uh, I've always wanted to do that uh, ever since the car came back, was just uh, restore one end. Do, like, take four windows and restore one end. You know, the interior, the beautiful interior wood, um, you know, the exterior, so on and so forth. So we had a little free time on Saturday during one of our work sessions, and I said, hey, Matt, how about if we just paint this one side uh, Tuscan Red. Um, I have a 1957 or 1959 drift, drift card from the, the Penzi archives. The Tuscan Red, I had a matched at the local hardware store, computer match. So we had a, a quart of Penzi Red. So, you know, Matt set himself up with uh, with the sander and he started to sand the, the, the siding and, you know, we put some paint on it. And I said, ah, right, go ahead. Let's, let's do up above. Well, about Two or three minutes into the process, he said, hey, take a look at this. Uh, he sanded away some paint and revealed some gold pinstriping um, above the window uh, on the bathroom end of the car, the toilet end of the car. And we just we were all amazed and astonished that it was still there. So he carefully worked through that and revealed some more of the, the gold pinstriping. We masked that off with some blue painter's tape, uh, painted, uh, you know, painted over it, and then pulled the tape off to to you know show the the gold striping but we did get one side of the the coach end painted just to show folks you know what the tuscan red look like what the whole car is going to look like when it's finished and you know we're, we're just going to continue that process on that end during our next work session but yeah it's it's stuff like that that you find that's just uh that makes you want to come back and and just proud to work on it so all of this begs the question jim how did you get your start into railroad preservation? Well, I, I've been a modeler on and off for ever since I was in ninth grade, you know, started a couple layouts, never finished them, um, you know, HO, O scale, narrow gauge, so on and so forth. So I've always been a, a builder uh, for quite a long time. And um, it was always fascinating to me to, to read the trade publications, so to speak, you know, railroad and rail fan trains, even Model Railroad or Narrow Gauge Gazette, uh, and most of the books on all of the narrow gauge lines, um, you know, where rail fans would find a piece of equipment and they would restore it. Um, you know, that's I've always been into history and preserving history, and I just think this is a great tribute to Greene County history and the W&W history to take this piece of equipment and uh, and preserve it, you know, which is the restoration effort. So I've always been interested in that and been reading about restoration for years and years and years and years. And now we have the opportunity to actually do it. Um, as, as I express to the folks who are hesitant to come down, you know, I don't think they want to come down on the work sessions because they don't have any knowledge. Well, I don't either. My knowledge is book knowledge. Um, uh, we just dive into something. We we look at it. We you know do our analysis. Okay, this piece comes off, and this piece comes off, and this fits together like this, and and we just started to disassemble it um, again, carefully documenting fo you know the whole nine yards. But I don't have any experience whatsoever, and uh, welcome anybody who is a uh, an expert uh, 
or has done this before to come down and give us a hand. We, we welcome each and anybody at any level expertise to come in and do it. So for me, it's just a, a one-to-one big model, so to speak, that we're working on. You know, instead of HO scale, we're on a one-to-one prototype scale here. Well, and we all have to cut our teeth somewhere as far as learning if we take an interest in this type of thing. We all have to begin somewhere and, and learn. One of the interesting things I discovered while reading the book was that, um, I and mean, it's fitting because actually this episode is sponsored by the Age of Steam Roundhouse, whose chief mechanical officer is none other than Tim Spasato. Tim back in the 70s and 80s, was very involved in the initial uh, restoration of the steam locomotive. So it just goes to show how kind of it's a cycle of learning. And there's always networked people and uh, uh, people when you need that super expertise in a particular field. There's always somebody that you can go to who has that type of knowledge. Exactly. Uh, Tim Spasato, Brad Lester, and Bob Brendel, who was from right there in, in Waynesburg, um, they did the entire uh, restoration right there on the grounds. Uh, nothing was sent out. Uh, they had a local machinist uh, uh, did some machining for them, but they retubed it right there on the grounds, um, jacked it up, uh, sandblasted it, painted it, repaired the whole nine yards without a back shop. So that's that's a very good point, uh, Nick. Is that uh, you know that's that's what they did back in the day, and that's how they cut their teeth. And now, you know, Tim is master steam mechanic out there at the at the Roundhouse, and and working on all different facets of, of steam locomotives. So you got to get your start somewhere. Um, we're smart enough that we're not going to damage the coach um, if we get to something that you know we're over our head. We're going to take a pause and definitely bring in the experts, uh, whether that be uh, uh, straightening the frame, um, you know, some just something that needs a major, major, uh, major fix, repair, fabrication. Uh, we're definitely bringing in the experts. We we do not want to destroy this piece because of its uh, unique history and its importance in the history of Green County. So. That's why we're just taking our time and and doing the documentation as we go along. A motivator for looking forward to continuing to make progress with all these projects is the fact that it seems like the Greene County Historical Society has a lot of public events going on of different themes and different types. So there's always good opportunities to showcase the work that you and the team are doing and bring more people into the railroading side of history and its preservation. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've had a change of leadership at the, uh, the historical society. Uh, we have a brand new uh, executive director, Matt Cumberlege. He is a Waynesburg native, um, a historian, a uh, reenactor, civil war reenactor. Uh, Matt has completely changed the look of the historical society, the museum grounds so on and so forth. Uh, we have a brand new board and enthusiastic president. Um, they have pushed all the chips in on the railroad projects. Uh, they've basically given us carte blanche to do whatever we want um, to restore, uh, restore the locomotive, restore the coach. Uh, we have a seven ton Plymouth locomotive that we're working on. Uh, you know, 400 feet of track that needs to be fixed. Uh, we have to come up with our own money. Um, that's fine. We can you know go after grants and whatnot, but um, they are saying go ahead because once this stuff is is restored or even to operational, it's just going to bring even more people in to the museum uh, to see it operate and to explore the museum itself. And it's just a win 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 situation all around. Uh, we're just so fortunate that we had a a leadership change late last year and early this year. If people are looking to support your restoration efforts and the mission of the museum overall, how can they best do that? Uh, get on the, the website, Green County Historical Society in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. Um, call down, ask for Matt Cumberlege, who's our executive director. Uh, he'll he'll walk you through the process if you would like to make a donation, or even if you want to, you know, uh, attend one of our work sessions. Uh, give Matt a call. Um, he'll pass off my information. You can get a hold of me. Um, I'm, I'm really working through Matt right now. So he knows what's going on. Uh, that's one thing I did promise him and the president 
that they would be fully apprised of what's going on, either monetarily wise, restoration wise, or anything with the railroad projects. Uh, so they are fully aware of what's going on. So it's just best to work through Matt uh, right now. And then um, if you do show up at a work session, then we, we can walk, work offline from there. But the initial contact is through Matt. Um, he likes to know, uh, you know, new volunteers uh, that, that want to come in to uh, come into the museum. Or again, if you you would like uh, to support us financially, uh, Matt is the guy and he can walk you through that process. Last question that I have for you, Jim. At the end of the day, what do you enjoy most about bringing this railroad back to life? All uh, that's an easy one, Nick. All of the the people. The kind people, um, the informative people that I have met throughout the past 25, 30 years, I've been researching this railroad. Um, we do have a fantastic group of railroad buffs that are just willing to jump in, uh, offer information, lend a hand, and you know, get you to somebody else who who has a skill, you know, like a. Um, you know, uh, a contractor to come in to help us or, or whatever the case may be. It's just interacting with all the great people in, in our railroad world. Um, it's just fascinating of, you know, there's other people out there like me. Sometimes you feel like you're all alone. And you're the geek, you know, the railroad geek. But um, there are just so many, many, many. I just uh, I have a countless list of fantastic people out there that have just supported me uh, generally in the railroad specifically to, to, um, to push our cause forward. So, you know, huge thanks to, to everybody out there that, that we, I have interacted with over the last 25, 30 years. That's what I enjoy the most. Yeah. It's fun to work on a steam locomotive. It's great. We're working on the coach, but the, the friendships that I have, uh, that I have because of these projects, you know, that's just, that's just priceless in my book. It fits the people out there. Agreed. The website is greencountyhistory.org. You also, if you are on Facebook, you can search Waynesburg and Washington Railroad. There's a Facebook group where Jim and others share photographs and memories of the railroad, which you're encouraged to join. Jim, thank you so much for joining us here on The Roundhouse to discuss the work that you're doing. It fits wonderfully into the museum as a whole, but also it serves as an excellent tribute to this railroad. Thank you so much for your work and for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Thanks so much. And now, the question of the day. Last time on The Roundhouse, we were hearing from Steve Weaver of the Strasburg Railroad about how they balance their tourist operations with freight, which led to the question, what is your favorite Shortline Railroad. A lot of responses across all the platforms. First from the roundhousepodcast.com, Cameron writes, I'm not sure it counts because the railroads are now associated with tourist operations, but my favorite shortline freight railroad would have to be a tie between East Broadtop and the Rio Grande's narrow gauge line. It's easy to forget that those railroads, before they were tourist lines, actually served an important job of serving small towns in the mountains in the era before roads and main lines could connect them. And without their existence, those towns likely would have not survived into the 21st century. From Twitter, Shortline614 writes, Historic, the Washington and Old Dominion. Modern, the Florida Gulf and Atlantic. And from Facebook, Kevin Dorn writes, McLeod River Railroad, SD38s and 4% grades. Last one to share with you, and this one educated me in a way, comes from Jacob Taylor, and he emailed this one directly. He says, My favorite short line is one that is fairly unknown to most people, but just like Strasbourg has a very interesting history behind it. The Crab Orchard and Egyptian Railroad in Marion, Illinois, started life in 1971 as a tourist line on the trackage that was leased from the Illinois Central. With only a small porter built 242, the railroad began freight operations in 1977. In 1979, the CNE decided to retire their 242 in favor of a newly acquired 280. This engine's career didn't last long, as during a run in 1986, the dry pipe that fed steam into the cylinders collapsed, rendering the engine inoperable. Thankfully, today, the CNOE still operates as part of the Progressive Rail Corporation. However, they no longer operate steam. This little short line, at just two and a half hours from my house, 
has a very interesting history, especially when they were considered to be the last railroad in the U.S. to heavily rely on steam for regular freight operations. It might even make for an interesting episode of the Roundhouse. That's true, Jacob. That could make for an interesting episode. Your question of the day for this episode is, what do you enjoy about discovering a new railroad? I ask this because recently, as you can tell, I've fallen in love with the Waynesburg and Washington Railroad. It's just such a nifty little short line, and I always love that sort of discovery period of a railroad, like, oh, there's this railroad in this part of the world, and what did they do, and what was their motive power, and what was their history? I love that exploration. Right now, I'm reading a book on the Rutland Railroad, which is one that I've had some interest in before. I have relatives that live in Vermont. But now I'm really delving into it, and I love the discovery that you get when you delve into this history. And that's part of the beauty of what we get to do here on The Roundhouse. Thanks for listening in, and remember, as always, that you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and other forms of communication, email. And if you like the show and you want to support us and help for us to cover expenses with web hosting and covering events across the country... You can donate to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the roundhouse and you get early access to episodes at $5 or more a month. Thank you so much to those of you who do support us. And remember, as always, that the roundhouse is our house. <laughs>